Y'all ready? We're in part four of this series called Who Am I? It's very, it, we've been like learning so much about our identity in Christ and this whole, this whole series has been, how do I face different challenges in life? We started it off with, when I, who am I when I don't feel like I measure up? And then we followed it up with, who am I when I'm compared to others, when I feel like I'm comparing myself to the people around me and I don't measure up in that sense? And then Tiffany blew it out of the water last week. Who am I when I feel alone? And we talked about spiritual family and just the, the, the fact that we need to not just have 2,000 friends on Facebook. We need to have a handful, maybe even count them on one hand, people that care about you, people that will text you, people that call you, people you can talk with. And that makes all the difference. When I feel alone, that's, that's who I am when I, when, I, when I get together with my spiritual family. Today, today we're going to talk about the funnest topic possible. Who am I when I failed? Who am I when I failed? Come on, who's excited to talk about failure today? No, I promise it's going to be fun. We're going to have a good time. Because you need to know that this failure question, there's no better person to talk to than, than the apostle Peter. Peter wrote a book or two. He was the main disciple of Jesus, and he is who we're going to look at today. But you need to know this, that Peter was involved in this time when Jesus was asking the who am I question. Jesus personally asked. He didn't ask it to himself. He asked it to the people around him. Who do people say that I am? Here's the scripture in Matthew 16. He says this, then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? So there's Jesus asking this who am I question. Then Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Let me just stop right there and share something with you. There's gonna be elements of your faith. There's gonna be times in your life where it's not logic that's gonna help you through the toughest times of life. There's going to be times where you need to step out in faith and just believe because heaven is going to reveal some things to you that aren't you know, on your calculator adding up just right. Now, I would never prescribe to you, you need to get a lobotomy to follow Jesus. Not never, not ever. That's just not being wise. Use your brain and it's always going to be good for you to do that. But there's going to be times, and maybe you've experienced this, where you just have a, a belief and you know you need to step out in faith and trust this process and I need to put myself out there and, and trust some people or, or trust God. And that's what Jesus says to Peter. Heaven has revealed some things to you. You didn't learn this from men. You learned this from heaven. So this is a major victory for Peter. And then he goes, Jesus goes on to say this. Now I say to you, you are Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Amen, somebody? Like some church people need to say amen right there. That's a, that's a really nice one. We find out, and listen to this, listen to this. This is important. We find out who we are after we discover who Jesus truly is for us. And that's what happened with Peter. Once he, once he figured out that Jesus was his Lord and his Savior, Jesus says, now let me tell you who you really are. What, now that you know who I really am, Peter, let me tell you who you really are. You're going to be the first pastor. You're going to be the first preacher. You're going to be the first evangelist that reaches thousands of people. Once you figure out who Jesus is in your life, then you're going to start to find out how you really fit in in this life. That is an important thing. Our calling follows our belief in Jesus, absolutely 100% the truth. Our calling follows our belief in Jesus. But failure is a part of life. I need to tell you that. It's not always rainbows and sunshine and picking daisies and oh, life is just so good. I follow Jesus and everything works perfectly all the time. No, 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 no. There's, there's time. I know I don't need to explain this to you. You, you know that, this, that life is tough and failures come and because nobody's perfect, I'm not. I mean, I got story after story. I had to narrow down my stories for today of all my failure stories. You'll, you'll hear a couple, but I had to narrow it down. And I'd be like, man, you can't tell them this one. You can't tell them this one. Let me tell them some, some that'll just work. And let me just say something about failure that you might already know. Write this in your notes if you're taking notes with me. If you're not taking notes, go ahead and write this down. <laughs> all failure is painful. All failure is painful, but not all failure is equal. Not all failure is equal. It's, it all hurts. All failure that we experience, it all hurts, but not all failure hits us the same way. Let me explain. Um, this last week, I started, I have a couple life groups that I'm a part of. The, one of my life groups is a golfing, men's golfing life group. And I was out there playing with the fellas and everything was going good. But let me just tell you something about me. I'm a bit of a class clown. 
All right, so when, when people are around and I get a little jokey and I'm feeling good, and so I was feeling jokey on the, on the very last hole that people were there, and I'm like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be so funny. <laughs> I'm going to hit into the group ahead of me, <sighs> which if you play golf, it's such a, such a stupid thing to do. Don't, do. don't ever do what I did, but I was feeling silly, and I wasn't thinking, and I hit, and it went right over their heads. I smashed it. Oh, I put everything into it, and I was feeling Hulk smash and it and it was so and as soon as I hit the ball I knew that was stupid I should not have it's so dangerous right it's not a fun thing to do it's not smart it's not funny and the group ahead of me like some of my friends there like once we met up like oh, once the hole was over they were like yeah man what were you thinking what were you doing and I was like trying to play it off because I felt you know embarrassed but the truth was at right after that I had to like repent to everybody. I had to text them. I'm like, so sorry. I was feeling, I uh, just, uh. you ever felt that way? You just made a stupid mistake and you had to own up to it right away. That was a silly mistake, but not all mistakes are just that simple that you can just apologize for and they're gone, right? It's all fixed up. Everybody's like, oh, you rascal. No big deal. Not all. One of my friends really said that. You rascal. It made me feel a little better. I don't know why, but it was very comforting to hear that. So that's a simple failure that I was just able to um, repent for, but there are some other failures that I've had in my life that were life-altering, life-changing. Um, one of many um, was when I was eight, 18 years old, just turned 18 years old, and I had a friend who didn't really know how to drive, never had a car. I mean, he's 18. In my mind, I've been driving since I was 15 and a half. I'm like, what, what kind of weirdo doesn't drive? But nowadays, that's the norm. But for me, I was like, all right, I'll let you drive my truck. So I had a little Toyota truck, and we were in the um, parking lot of an apartment complex. And so I let him get in the driver's side. I'm in the passenger side, and he's never driven before. I, did, I was not aware of how clueless he was about driving. <laughs> and he turns the car on, and he's like, all right, what do I do? I said, put it in reverse, man. Put, you got to get out of here, right? <laughs> Duh. Put it in, he puts it in reverse, and we start to roll back because he didn't know to put his foot on the brake. I'm like, <laughs> First, put your foot on the brake, man. So he sticks his foot into the gas, and we start flying back at full speed. What we didn't know is that there was a maintenance man behind us, and he was standing there working on a window or something, and the car smashes him into the building. We pin this guy going back at full speed. We pin him in between my truck and the building. We are freaking. As soon as we got the car turned off, we get out. And there's the man, and his leg is severed from his body. His whole leg came off. I can't even think about it right now. It's, I, I narrowed this down, okay? This is, a, this is a, believe it or not, I'm telling you, and this is how it went. This is how this story went. We're out of the car. We're out here. And this man on the ground, he starts calling the shots. He looks at me and says, get my phone out of my pocket. Call my wife. Tell her I'm going to be okay. And then he looks at my friend and says, take my belt off, tie it around my thigh. I, could, I, I didn't even know what was going on. I'm freaking out. I'm, I'm an 18-year-old, scrawny little, just absolutely messed up guy. I'm looking at this, and it was, it was absolutely crazy. It was, it was traumatic. And by the time everything's said and done, this man lost his leg. He lost his leg because of my mistake. I shouldn't have let, I shouldn't have let my friend do that. Now, some failures are silly, right? But some failures... Not all failure is created equal. That failure, all these years later, I'm not going to tell you how many years. I'm going to let you think I'm young, okay? But when I was 18, that was a lot of years ago, and I still think about that. I, I can't believe I did that. And I'm so ashamed that I let that happen. But maybe you have had something in your life happen like that where you made a mistake. It was an accident, or maybe it was willful disobedience. I don't know. But something happened in your life where it was life-altering, life-changing. Those, those are the big failures um, we all experience failure, and on the, while all failure is painful, it's not all created equal. Maybe you've experienced like some, some failures at work where you've just had some pressure on you at work, and then you've made some bad choices, said some things you shouldn't have said, and now maybe you're out of work or at least struggling very greatly in your workplace. Maybe there, you had a difference of opinion with a friend, and then you started talking about it online, or maybe you were texting, and you said some things, you threw some things out that you didn't mean, or maybe you knew you shouldn't have said and now your relationship is stranded and shipwrecked and this person that you love, you are severed from. Maybe, maybe uh, you had a message in your inbox and 
you knew you shouldn't have responded to it because this is an old friend from, from high school and you're a happily married person now, but you, in a moment of weakness, responded to that. And now your marriage is on the rocks if you still have it at all. I understand what it, what it feels like to experience failure, and I have a feeling you do too. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be here if you didn't want to get closer to what is the solution, what can I do? Maybe you experience like an injury and you got prescribed uh, some medication and you re-upped that medication one too many times and now you're hooked. You didn't mean for it to happen, but it happened and now you're there. Maybe you looked at some things, did some things, said some things, and you failed, even, even based on your own standards. Based on your own standards, you didn't measure up. There's a thousand ways for us to feel like we failed, and the sting of failure is no respecter of persons. We've all been there. We all face this, young and old, rich and poor. If you are hearing the sound of my voice, you've experienced this feeling of failure, of making a mistake, of falling short, whether by your standards or by God's. So let's look at one of the more spectacular failures ever recorded in the Bible, this man, Peter. So we talked about his victory, right? But Peter, what you need to understand about Peter and what makes this failure of his so spectacular is that he was, he was the most outgoing disciple of them all. Let's not forget, if you know from the first place, that Peter was the one who walked on water. He was the one who had the faith to get out of the boat, walk on the water. He was the most craziest, ready, fire, aim guy. I love Peter. I love his story. I resonate with it. He's a little bit crazy. He's a little bit weird, but he's like, he's a go-getter. And some of the boldest and most passionate people are the ones that fail the best. And I know that feeling because we just love to go out there and we're okay to take risks. And that's how, that's how failures happen. But Peter, this is his story. Let's just, let's just start with this. Luke 22, this is the story of Peter's failure. This is the moment when Jesus is arrested. Jesus is being taken away. They arrested him, Jesus, and led him to the high priest's home, and Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire. Make a note of that. We're going to come back to this because this is not the last fire Peter is going to see uh, by the time this service is over. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it. Peter joined them there, but a servant girl noticed him from the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers, but Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. This was the guy that said, he's the, he's the king, he's the Messiah. I don't even know him. Now, moments later, he doesn't even know him. Doesn't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No man. And then notice this I am statement. I am not. It's a part of my identity that I don't know him. This series is called, Who Am I? And Peter's like, I'll tell you who I am right now is someone who doesn't know who that is. This is big. Peter was with Jesus for three years, left his career, left his family to follow Jesus. And here he is right now. This is a big, big moment in his life. And then he said, I am not, I am not. About this, about an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them because he's a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately when he was still speaking, the rooster crowed at that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Suddenly the Lord's words, because Jesus predicted this. He predicted that Peter was gonna deny him. Jesus knew this was gonna happen. Keep that in your mind. And, and this flashed in Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you'll deny three times that you even know me, big shot. You're, you're not even gonna admit that you know me. And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. You don't have to raise your hands. Have you ever wept bitterly? I have. It hurts. It like hurts your face. It hurts like, I can think about it right now, like hurts like the back of your, like the, the nose, the eyes, the, the throat, they're all tied together. When you're weeping bitterly, it just like hurts your whole head. You've been crying so hard. Nobody has to raise their hand, but if you've ever felt that, it's a painful experience to weep bitterly over something. The pain of Peter's failure was very intense. He walked away just in, he was sobbing uncontrollably. Try and picture this. Peter is, he's absolutely devastated, devastated by, our, by his failure. And, and that's exactly where we find ourselves at times, devastated by our own failure. And I know what it feels like. You feel like you'll never get past it. You know, we, oh, I can't recover from this. Things will never be okay again. You know, never recover from the failure that you're, you're, when you're in the middle of it, it feels like you're trapped in it. It feels like you're stuck in it. When the pain, you, when you're in it, it feels like it's never gonna leave you. And we, we just lose all foresight to, to understand that 
this is gonna pass because when you're in the middle of pain, it feels like it's not gonna pass. This is one of those profound and humiliating failures. Uh, Peter's behavior violated and contradicted his own character. He was known for being bold and courageous. He was the one known for, for stepping out and he was one of the top disciples, but here he was being the most the one most willing to abandon Jesus in his worst time. Now he's cowering in fear, forsaking his ride or die. You know, it's crazy. Whether it's big or small, every single one of us is going to experience failure like that. You probably already have, but if you haven't, just get ready (laughs) because we all experience times in life like this. That's why it's so important to talk about failure, disappointment, mistakes that that come to every single one of us. And when failure comes, one of two things can happen. And I want you to remember this. I want you to write this down. The reason why I I ask you guys to take notes is because I want you to remember this. I don't want you to walk out of this place remembering the principles and truths about God's word and how they can help you for the rest of your life especially if you're new-ish, you feel new to church and you feel new to the Lord, I I want you to to know that these things are helpful right away, that you don't have to get your act together for these things to work for you. And we're gonna start to get into some things that can maybe start to help you in your place in life. Failure can either do one of two things. Here it is. Failure can either distort or clarify your identity. Failure can either distort or clarify your identity and it's all about how you respond to it. It's all about how you respond to it. Let me tell you what the enemy would love to do. The enemy would love in your failure to keep you trapped in your shame. The enemy would love to, to keep you in a place and keep you in a headspace where if you've made a mistake, he wants to trap you there. He wants to keep you there. It's called condemnation. I'm gonna get into that in a minute. That's what the enemy of your soul, who is alive and well, by the way, he does not want you to thrive. He does not want you to succeed. And so when failure comes and you feel trapped, you need to know that's the enemy, the enemy of your soul trying to trip, trip you up, keep you down. And that's called shame. There is no shame. There is no condemnation in Christ, but I am getting there. But this is what God wants to do in the midst of your failure. That's right. In the midst of your failure, God wants to do something. You know what God wants to do? He wants to highlight areas of growth in your life. I know it's hard to think about sometimes in my failure. I just want to feel better. But God is the kind of God that even in the midst of your failure, he says, but look how, it can, how this can shape you, how this can edify you, how this can make you stronger, how this can build you up so that you don't have to experience it again, son. How you don't have to experience this kind of pain again, daughter. I don't want you to have to go through this over and over again. He wants you to grow. He wants you to learn. So even in the midst of failure, God can set you up and, and to grow and thrive arrive even in the middle of a failure. That's something important to know. It's all about how we respond though, because the choice is up to us. The choice is up to us how we respond to the failure. We can choose to stay in the shame and the guilt and the, the misery. And let me tell you, it's the instinctual way. This is the natural way. But the God way is to say, what, how can I, how can I recover? From, how can this clarify my identity? How can, instead of being identified by that failure, how can, I, how can I grow from it? Whether you are a parent, a mentor, or a coach, or whether you just need to hear this for yourself today, I want you to memorize this statement I'm about to tell you. You may have failed, but you are not a failure. Let's say it together. You may have failed, but you are not a failure. And let me say it over you. You may have failed, but you are not a failure. You, we need to separate. We need to separate some things that our heart doesn't need to take that on. And, and it's important for your kids to understand this, that because they failed, that doesn't make, that it's not their identity. If you have a mentoring or coaching relationship with anybody, maybe it's a peer, remember that statement. Use it on others. You know, we will always want to help others. We want to be a lifeline to others. But maybe for you, if you failed, you need to understand you are not a failure. That does not make you as a person a failure. You may have failed, but you are not a failure. Otherwise, you're gonna stay in, once you identify that way, you are gonna stay in that failure and participate in more of the same kind of failure. Why? Because that's how you see yourself. And that's not what God wants for you. He doesn't want you to see yourself as junk, as trash. He created you. 
He made you. He loves you. He wants you to grow, thrive, turn into someone that you've never been before, make you new. Ever heard that? That's what he wants. He doesn't want you to stay there. He doesn't want you to stay stuck. Failure brings one of two things. Let me talk about conviction versus condemnation. Very important concept for right now. Conviction is not bad. Conviction is a very good thing. Conviction brings us back to God when we've made a mistake and we are prompted to repent from it. That's like my little golfing story. I made a mistake and I (laughs) repented, turned from it, all good. That's conviction. Conviction is what brings us back. It's the feeling. Conviction, if you've never heard this explained, conviction is the feeling, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't be doing this, or I shouldn't have done this, and now I want to try and do something to make it better. That's what conviction is, and conviction is a good thing. Condemnation, on the other hand, is from the enemy. That's that feeling of being trapped inside the failure, that there's no hope for you, that you are a failure, that, he wants, that the enemy wants to make that a permanent thing, that you're damaged goods, or God no longer sees value in you. God's given up on you. No one is ever going to trust you again. You ever felt that way? I have. I felt that way. That's condemnation. It's from the enemy, and it's never true. Never true. God always wants us to be restored, always wants us to grow. I got to tell you a story about when I learned about conviction for the very first time, because I had no idea what conviction meant, condemnation meant. I was in the Salvation Army in Stockton. That's how I got saved, by the way. I got saved in rehab. Come on, somebody. You got to pass through the past up in this place. I got 16 years clean now, and uh, some of that is just, I've just been muddling along, you know, but you guys have really been supportive of that. You know, it's, it's not every day that you know, someone with a background like that is given permission to lead such a great, great group of people. So I appreciate that. You have always supported me in that. I'm grateful for it. But I got saved in the Salvation Army. I was in a, I was in a drug rehab program and I was there six months. And if you're there at the Salvation Army for six months, you're basically the boss, okay? You haven't got kicked out in six months, you're in charge. You're in charge of the place. You get the best job. You're all, everyone looks up to you because they're all new. And I was there six months, you know, and I, I, I was doing good, and I was driving the forklift. I'm the foreman of the, of the warehouse, and I had all the best things. But I was taking an overnight pass, and I had a meeting card. I was supposed to get a signature on it. Um, to, I was supposed to go to an AA meeting, and I was supposed to get a signature, but I didn't, I didn't go to an AA meeting on my pass. Instead, I forged my signature on there. How would they ever know, right? I mean, I could have got away with it, but I came back in. I went to, so I was the secretary of the meeting that I came home from that day. I was a secretary of my own meeting that night. If you don't understand what that means, don't worry about it. I was sitting up front, I was facilitating the meeting, and I had a co-secretary who's supposed to sign all the cards. So my co-secretary is signing my card. He gets to mine and leans over and whispers to me, did you go to a meeting when you went home? I'm like, yeah, man, yeah, thanks for asking. And then, and then he, he didn't leave it alone. And then he kept asking, did you see anybody you knew there? I'm like, no. In fact, I didn't see anybody there. Why don't you mind your own business? And he kept on like, oh, was it cool? Was it a good meeting? And I'm like, dude. And then I had this thing happen to me where I'm sitting in front of everybody and I had this sensation like, there's like 50 people out in this meeting and they're all looking at me like, like I'm to be emulated. And I had this feeling wash over me of conviction, like what I'm doing is not right. This is not right. What am I doing? I'm still lying. I'm still cheating. And I just, something happened. They weren't teaching me about the nuances of conviction and condemnation. Man, it's a drug program, man. It's just come to Jesus every meeting, right? Like, oh, I didn't know, but it just was happening inside of me. And I knew what I did was wrong and I had to confess. But what you need to know about that offense is it's automatic kick out. Automatic, your your program's done. There's no conversation whatsoever. And I, I had a feeling, but I went to the resident manager. I laid my card down and said, that signature's not mine. He said, oh, Elliot, why'd you have to tell me this? He knew, I knew. After six months, I I got kicked out of the program, had to go back to jail. I had to start my program over again, over that. But let me tell you the truth about something. Let me tell you how hindsight is 2020. Sometimes going through hard stuff and, and actually facing conviction and doing the right thing, if I had not gone back to my hometown and spent a little bit of time in jail and figured out a couple things, I probably would have moved back there permanently had I not gone back there for a minute and figured some things out. Me responding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in that seemingly insignificant moment changed the trajectory of my life. And that's where I made the decision to stay here and start coming to this church 
and meet my wife here and everything that I have in my whole entire life is really, it comes from that moment of conviction and responding to it. Every single one of us, probably every day, have the sensation of conviction and we have the option to, to actually move forward in that and repent from it or to ignore it. And let me tell you something about conviction. The longer you ignore conviction, the quieter it will get. And that's scary. You don't want that to happen. You don't want that to happen, everybody. So this is what I want you to do. Uh, number one, the first thing, and this is what I kind of explained to you already, is you need to separate your failure from your identity. That's number one. Separate your failure from your identity. Walk in conviction, move forward, and let God's identity wash over you. So the second thing I want to explain is this. The second, the second healthy response to failure is this. Recognize the factors that fuel Failure. There's so many F's in that statement. <laughs> I, like, it's hard to say. Recognize the factors that fuel failure. Because sometimes you just need to change a couple things in your life and less failures would come your way. Amen, somebody? I'm not looking at anybody. I can't even see you. It's too dark in here. I'm not, I can't see you. All right, it's not you. It's not you. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about me. Jesus told Peter what was going to happen. And Peter was like, nah. Nuh-uh, I'm not going to deny you. Come on, you're the man. I'm not gonna, come on, it's all good, Jesus. You're the Messiah. He, he, he didn't listen to him. But if we would listen to Jesus when he tells us, hey, let me tell you, you're on your way to some failure. You're on your way. You're setting yourself up to, to have a hard time down the road. If we recognize the factors that fuel failure, then we can avoid some needless opportunities for growth. Let me tell you four things that fuel failure every time for every person. Number one is this. It's like a sub point under number two is good intentions without wisdom. Good intentions without wisdom. All right, you can have a big heart. You can love Jesus, but without wisdom, discernment, and godly counsel, you're gonna have a bad time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to have to like tell you that. You're, you're in church to have a good time. You're like, I just need to have a good heart, right? That's a great place to start. That's a great place to have a good heart, have integrity, and you're just like, oh, I just love Jesus. I don't know nothing, but I just love Jesus. Hey, perfect, wonderful. Let's, I'll meet you there, but I want to let you know, I don't want you to stay there forever where you're just like, there's another in the fire. You're like falling yourself into your own fire every time. I want to, maybe you can avoid some fire sometimes just by understanding that this path you know, you, you can have some wisdom and save yourself a lot of trouble. Um, you are just going to have a bad time if you don't do this. Uh, the Bible says this in Proverbs. I don't have it on the screens for you, but I'd love for you to just know it. Gain wisdom. Gaining wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. It's a statement from Proverbs, and it seems a little repetitive, kind of silly way to say it. What it's basically saying is seeking wisdom and desiring to be wise is wise. <laughs> It is wise to want to be wiser than you are. Just a little bit about me, a little bit about how, how I'm trying to move in that. My wife and I pray with each other every night. Don't get all excited. It's not always that spiritual. It's like a prayer meeting in there. No, no, no. Sometimes it's very short. Sometimes it's just a minute where we're just like, thank you for this day. Thank you for this food. We're not even eating. It's like, oh, I don't know. Just, you know, sometimes you just do it. But we, we pray together every night and it's after the kids go to bed and it's before the TV comes on. And we just pray right there. Sometimes it's short, sometimes it's long. And for a long time now, because I've been feeling it myself, I've just simply prayed, Lord, help me to be wise. That's what I pray every single night. Lord, help me to be wise, because I want to be wise. That's what Solomon wanted, to lead a great number of people, and that's what I want. I want to be wise too. And that would be wise for you to pray. Lord, help me to be wise. How do we do that? Uh, read your Bible. <laughs> Read your Bible. Get in there. Get on a Bible reading plan. That's what I do. I just fought. get on that YouVersion Bible app, get a plan, do it, and do what it says. And on top of that, get into a life group around, around people that are going to give you godly counsel, people who, with a proven track record of success, people whose lives you wouldn't mind having. It's important to, when you're getting advice from people to look at their lives. Because some people are getting advice from you know, Joe in accounting, you're getting marriage advice from Joe in accounting who's on his third marriage. Listen, that advice is not even working for him, okay? So stay away from Joe's advice. Why don't you get into the Bible? I'm sorry, anybody named Joe. It was just an example. <laughs> um, my bad, my bad, my bad, B. It was not about you. It's not about you. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying, get your wisdom from the Bible and from godly people who uh, you can see would be worth 
following, all right? Um, uh, the second thing I want you to understand is emotional pressure can lead to, this is a factor that fuels failure. When you have emotional pressure, let me just explain something. You are the most likely to click the wrong link, cheat, and over-medicate after two weeks of travel and overwork. These are factors that fuel fit. If you are overworked, stretched to the max, working 12-hour days, that's when probably your failure is going to hit you, is if you're overextended, overstretched. This is a sub point about you need to have a day of rest. It's, it made it to God's top 10 list, in fact. Remember the Sabbath. It's almost like he's speaking to Americans. You know, Remember, you're supposed to take a day off. And you're like, no, uh I'm supposed to work hard, get lots of money. I'm supposed to have a boat, man. That's how I'm going to rest. I got you. I got you. But, but God is trying to tell us you need to remember that really everything you have comes from him. And one day a week, you ought to be giving it to him, saying, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. I believe in you. I want you to have a, a rhythm of rest one day a week, but I also want you to have good boundaries between work and home. This is something I've been talking with some men about quite a bit lately is, is having like, man, when, when you're off work, if you can do something to, to keep yourself, keep those boundaries, because if you don't, if you don't have clear boundaries, you're going to be thinking about work at home and you're going to think about home at work and you can't, you'll never feel rested. You'll never feel like you can be present in the moment. That's not what I want for you. And that if that goes on too long, that's when failure is going to come up. That's when mistakes get made. And that's when the pressure will begin to wear down on you. Another thing that fuels failure is willful disobedience. Okay, this is the one. This is kind of a tough one. Willful disobedience. This is when, I think this usually happens out of frustration. Have you ever felt frustrated? It's all right, you can admit it to me, all right? I'm secret safe with me, all right? Have you ever felt frustrated? Sometimes, though, we get so frustrated that we say, you know what, forget it. This whole God thing, this whole church thing, it's not working. I'm frustrated. I'm feeling burnt out. I, it's just not working for me. And that turns into willful, you know, I'm not gonna go that way anymore because it's, it's just whatever. Because you get frustrated, you get burned out. And I, believe me, it happens. But if you let it get to that place where, where it's willful disobedience and I know what's right, but I'm definitely not gonna do it because I'm just sick of all that. That's also called rebellion. And the Bible talks about rebellion like witchcraft and witchcraft, and another way to talk about it is just like, that's, in, that's permission to let evil just like into your life. Hello, evil. Why don't you come and fill my heart? Why don't you fill my heart with darkness and bitterness and wrath? You know, it's, it's an open door. This is how I was taught about it. It op Willful disobedience, rebellion, saying, you know what? I know what's right, but I'm choosing not to do it. It opens the door of our heart to say, okay, evil, come on in. And that's when you have those feelings like, oh, even when you want to do right, you can't. Even when you want to do the right thing and you try to, you, there's something inside of you that's making you go the wrong way. That's when you've opened the door up. And all I have to say about this is if you, if you find yourself in that place, get out, run, turn, turn today and say, you know what? That I felt that way. And all I'm trying to do is, is I'm, I'm ready to get out of there. I'm ready to get out of that place. I don't want to be in that place anymore. I don't want to be willfully disobedient and let evil into my life anymore. I want to I'm ready to come back. And even if I'm not perfect, even if whatever, I'm just trying to come back. Don't get stuck in that place of rebellion. And the last one I have to touch on is sometimes the circumstances beyond your control. Hey, you've been waiting on this one, right? Like, how about I didn't do it? <laughs> it wasn't me. Sometimes, because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world where there's sickness and disease and hardship and heartbreak. And sometimes it's just, it's not your fault. You didn't do it. And what, all I have to say about this is to let you know, remind yourself, this world is not my home. Jesus is my savior in this world. Heaven is my home. This world is not my home. In this world, I will have trouble, but take heart. Jesus has overcome the world and my home is with, in heaven with him. And so even though things are gonna go bad and wrong sometimes here, and it's not always even my fault, I can, I can know that, my permanent home is in heaven. My, my permanent home is with him where, where things are right and things are the way that they should be. Here's the last healthy response to failure I wanna share with you. Number three is this. This is profound. Jesus sees and is working toward 
the best version of you. In the midst of your failure, if, if you can recognize and realize that Jesus is working, he's working on you. He's dealing with you. He's helping you. He's working on the best version of you, or at least as close to it as you can possibly be on this side of heaven. God is working in you. Peter did what many of us do when we experience failure. You know what Peter did? He ran back to the old life. Hey, I know what I'll do. Before Jesus uh, showed up and before he called me out, I was a fisherman. So now that I'm not with Jesus and that's not even gonna work out anymore, I know what I'll do. I'll go back to the old life. He went back to the old version of, us, of ourselves. We've all experienced failure and I call that the first fire. But I wonder if you've ever really truly ever experienced real reconciliation after a failure. That's the second fire. And that's what I wanna to explain to you right here. Peter meets with Jesus after he's resurrected. Jesus gets resurrected. Everybody's talking about it. Everyone's seen him. And Peter's back in his old life. He's back in his old life. He's fishing and Jesus shows up to him the same way he showed up to him the first time while he was fishing and says, let down your net on the other side. And after he catches a bunch of fish, Peter's like, oh my God. It's my God. <laughs> oh my God, it's my God. And he jumps out and back, same old Peter, he jumps out, he swims out and, and they, they bring all the fish and they're having a meal. They start a fire. They cook some fish. They have fish for breakfast. Gross. <laughs> but I mean, where, I mean, that's what they're gonna have. That's... And this is the first time Peter and Jesus are talking after the big fail. This is the first time. And this is how it goes, John 21. John 21, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you, notice this, do you love me more than these? What's he talking about? Is he talking about the fish? Is he talking about the other disciples? I don't know, scholars debate, I don't care. It, it could just be, do you love me more than anybody? Do you love me like you said you loved me as a, as a Messiah, as a savior? Let's just go with that. Do you love me more than these? And Peter said, yes. Lord, you know all things. You know I love you more than these. And then he said, feed my lambs. Now listen, three times Jesus asks Peter the same exact thing. Do you love me? Guess what Jesus never brings up? The failure. Sometimes we have this, this idea like if we come back to God, if we show back up to church, that it's just gonna be nothing but condemnation, judgment, a bunch of I told you so's. And I need to tell you that even if a human being has done that to you, God would never do that to you. We have a God who comes running to us when we come back after our failure. That's who my God is. That's who our God is. He comes running to us and he only asks this one thing. I, I only need to know this one thing, Peter. Do you love me? Jesus had moved on, okay? He was wanting to know, Peter, can you move on? Can you come back to me? Jesus knew Peter was distraught, weeping, rehearsing the failure. Ever been there? Rehearsing the failure. Rehearsing over and over again, thank you. Rehearsing the failure, the pain. Jesus knew what he was going through, but he needed to know one thing. Peter, can you come back? Can you recover? and see the love that you once had for me. Do you love me? That's what he wants to know. Because listen, God already loves you. He's always loved you. you. You may have never been to church ever in your life. You already know one thing about God. He's a God of love. He always loves me. It's, you don't even have to show up to church to kind of know this, but think it through. He's always loved you. He always will. And you can't do anything to separate yourself from the love of God. If you didn't know, now you know. So Jesus was addressing the one thing in the midst of failure that needs to be addressed. Peter, do you still love me? Because something strange happens in the midst of our failure. And when we make mistakes or when terrible things happen, for some reason, we turn our hearts away from him when we fail. Maybe it's self-preservation. Maybe we just can't bear to face people or him or whatever and we turn our hearts away. 
But when we can learn and, and listen to Jesus as he's, do you love me? Can you come back? Can you recover from this? I've already gotten over it. I forgot about the failure. I forgive your sin as far as the east is from the west. I don't know if you tried to fly west long enough. You can't get to the east. It just keeps going. It's forever. He removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. It's not like north-south. You can fly south long enough and then start going north again. East and west doesn't work like that. He removes our sin and our mistakes and our failure as far as the east is from the rest. That's forever. See of forgetfulness. He's already forgiven you. He's covered you. Can you turn your heart back to him in the midst of a failure? Can you receive the kind of forgiveness, the kind of love, the kind of God that he truly is, the father, dang it, who comes running after us when we come stumbling back after a night of partying, after squandering the inheritance, after spitting in his face, so to speak, and we failed, we've messed up. And when we come limping back around, he hikes up his little whatever. This is the story of the prodigal son. It hits me every time where he comes running after us. It's too much for me because I know what it feels like to be forgiven for so much. Remember that guy who lost his leg? Somehow or another, my folks found out where he was in the hospital and I was already in the drug life. I had already, that was my first time to jail doing that. It was a bad, bad couple days and I was feeling pretty low. And somehow, I can't even remember how it went. My, 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 my memory's foggy back then. And, but somehow, me and my friend both got led to his hospital room. And I walked in, and the bandage that stops right here, and it's round, and I saw it, and I just, I couldn't keep it together. I mean, I did that. I didn't even say anything. This I remember. I didn't even say anything. The guy looks up at us, says, boys, I forgive you. I'd never been to church a day in my life at that point. I wasn't raised in church. I didn't know God. And I learned the biggest lesson on forgiveness that I might ever learn. Even though I wrecked this guy's life, wrecked his life, he was willing to forgive me. And I get a picture of what God must feel even though his son was on the cross and he was beaten and he was tortured and everything and then we come in, it's because of our sin he had to do that. It's because of our mistakes he had to do that. We come in, he says, I already forgave you. I already forgave you. I, I forgave you before you even thought about coming to this room. Before you even showed up to church today, he's been waiting, hoping that you would just turn your hearts back to him. I want you to know, like I found out, that kind of forgiveness is available to you. It's available to you over and over again. It's available to you right here, right now. And recognize that, that Jesus, he wants to restore you. He doesn't want you stuck down. He wants you to be lifted up. He wants you to, to lift your head. He is the lifter of our heads. I said, look up, child. Don't, don't look at yourself that way. I don't see you this way. Lift up. You are a son of the king. You're a daughter of the king. You, you could stop beating yourself up now. I've already forgiven you. If there is anyone that wants to receive that kind of forgiveness today, today's your day. Tomorrow's your day, yesterday was your day, every day is your day. But I'm gonna give you a chance to, to make that statement. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. This is a private moment, holy moment. So please, if you can, let's just honor the, the sensitivity of this moment for those that need it. Lord, I pray for open hearts. I pray for receptive hearts to receive this prayer today. If you if you are ready to turn your heart back to him and receive the forgiveness that he freely gives and make Jesus your Lord, your savior, your king, the lifter of your head, 
Would you just lift your hand up for me? I'm, I want to pray for you, and we're going to pray together. Yes, 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 yes. There's even young people that are ready to take this step. Amen. Yes, I see you. I see you. I see you. Hands all over the place. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray over every single person lifting their hands to you, ready to receive this forgiveness. Lord, I pray that right now that they would receive the forgiveness and receive the love that you have that has not changed in the midst of their failure, that has never wavered in the midst of their wandering. Lord, right here and now, all of us, if we would just say it together, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your spirit and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen.